This video provides an introduction to the main concepts used in Pierre Bourdieu's field theory. In order, the video outlines capital, field, nomos, doxa, allusio, habitus, and the avant-garde. Use the links in the video's description to go directly to any of these sections. Capital Capital is any resource which can produce surplus value once set into a circuit of exchange. It is important to understand that money is not, in itself, capital. If you earn €100 Euro a day, but your daily costs are also €100 Euro per day, this €100 Euro is not capital. If, however, you earn €1,000 Euro a day, and your daily costs are €100 Euro a day, the excess €900 Euro could become capital if... For example, you invested it in stocks or shares, or in such a way that it could accumulate more money. Bourdieu applied this concept to immaterial resources, such as social connections and cultural knowledge. Going back to our example, this means that if you spent the €900 Euro surplus income on a wine tasting course, this expenditure could still be considered capital if the knowledge you gained from the course provided you with an advantage in a particular field. For example, if you had to frequently attend business meetings in upscale dining locations, the possession of detailed viticultural knowledge could impress both colleagues and clients. For Bourdieu, the key species of capital are economic, social and cultural. Three other species of capital which are key to field theory are symbolic, specific and meta. In the following explanation, be aware of the distinction between species and forms of capital and states in which capital exists. Economic capital takes such forms as money, investments or property. Social capital refers to the social network of an agent. In fact, it is the resources made available to an agent by virtue of their social network. This could take the form of informal, professional or familial relations. Cultural capital refers to the cultural knowledge an agent has accumulated throughout their life. It appears in three distinct states, embodied, objectified and institutionalized. In an embodied state, it appears in forms such as knowledge, accent, dress, taste and posture. In an objectified state, it is constituted in objects such as artworks, books and furniture. For Bourdieu, artworks are particularly profitable forms of cultural capital because the specialised knowledge required to appreciate art is highly valued in Western cultures, is very difficult to fake and is capable of generating reputation for people by virtue of the social distinctions this knowledge communicates. In its institutionalised state, cultural capital appears in forms such as certificates, university degrees, qualifications and awards. In this way, it takes on an objective value. As such, documents like university degrees perform a function for cultural capital analogous to the function which money plays for economic capital. Symbolic capital is the resource of reputation that a person can use to gain advantages in different contexts. It can also be thought of as prestige, glory or renown. Unlike economic, social and cultural capital, it is not a distinct species of capital. It is the symbolic value that an agent's possession of these species gains for them once the possession is recognised by other agents. This recognition of an agent's symbolic capital is actually a misrecognition because the process of recognition involves attributing the symbolic capital possessed by an agent directly to that agent, thereby failing to properly account for the arbitrary means by which that agent accumulated those species. For example, if an agent is born into a wealthy family, they might have access to resources which can be invested in stocks, producing yet more money. They also have access to resources that can be invested in an expensive education at an elite university where they might make contacts that could be valuable in the future. Within different fields, such as art, science or the broader field of society in general, 
the value of these forms of capital are misrecognized as being essential to the agent when, in fact, their accumulation is largely arbitrary. This misconception is based, firstly, on an inability to recognize that people's accumulation of capital is primarily based on their existing possession of capital, mainly economic capital. Secondly, it is based on an inability to recognize non-economic forms of capital, and thirdly, on the different value that different forms of capital are given in different fields. Specific capital is the term given to any species or form of capital which is specifically valued in a particular field. For example, a knowledge of philosophy is specific capital in the field of contemporary art. Having served time in prison is a form of specific capital in the field of organised crime, and having social connections to famous sports people is specific capital in the field of sports journalism. Fields Fields can be understood as the social and professional contexts in which agents operate and in which they are hierarchically positioned. A field can be viewed as any context in which agents compete for reputation. Society is a field, education is a field, and birdwatching is a field. Different forms of capital are valued differently in different fields. For example, political capital is specific to the political field, artistic capital to the artistic field, and economic capital to the economic field. Fields are never completely autonomous from each other and are structured by their relation to other fields, primarily the field of power. The fields of economy and politics taken together constitute the field of power. This is because these fields have direct effects on every other field. For example, within the artistic field, particular styles or approaches acquire positions because of activities in the political field, such as the commissioning of apolitical paintings for public buildings. Moreover, national budgets for art and culture are determined in the political field. In the economic field, a financial crash can affect the value of artworks, cause the closure of galleries, and affect the systems of public art funding. Also, financial investment in a particular style of art can have determining effects on the types of art producers choose to make. Following this logic, the fields of politics and economy are said to possess meta-capital. Meta-capital is the power to affect the value of different forms of capital within a field and across different fields, and thereby influence the relative value of different fields within society. The field of media has also been proposed as a field which possesses meta-capital. To illustrate these field relations, in looking at a map of the literary field, we can see that it is positioned in connection to the field of power, and that both are positioned within the broader field of society. The positions of agents in a field is structured according to the amount and type of economic and cultural capital they possess. These are the axes of fields. Within cultural fields, these axes correspond to two subfields. A field of restricted production, oriented to accumulating cultural capital and to producing for a restricted audience, and a field of large-scale production, oriented to accumulating economic capital and to producing for a broader audience. It is better to think of cultural capital as specific capital because different forms of cultural capital are specific to different fields. The value of cultural capital is relative. Nomos Nomos is the term Bourdieu gives to the field-specific norms which regulate the actions of agents in a field. They are typically unspoken but universally understood by all agents in a field. These field-specific norms are the historical products of struggles within fields. In particular, they are the product of struggles over which forms of capital the field should value. So, for example, in 19th century France, when Courbet used the daily lives of peasants as subject matter in his paintings, he proposed a new vision of what should be considered valuable in the field. This vision conflicted with the existing nomos of the academy, which, for a variety of reasons, preferred the subject matter of romantic art. Changes to the nomos of a field typically originate in its avant-garde region. I just refer to nomos as corresponding to a particular perspective of the field. Bourdieu sees such perspectives as grounded in principles of vision and division. 
Nomos involves principles of vision in that it proposes a particular vision of the world as the legitimate vision. It involves principles of division in that this vision of the world is based on dividing groups, individuals, objects or practices into categories, that is, into hierarchical relations. An example of vision and division in the field of contemporary painting can be seen in the modern repudiation of paintings which uncritically represent women as objects of desire. This practice, once common for centuries, is now deemed chauvinist and guilty of representing the world according to the male gaze. A negative opinion of contemporary paintings which follow in this tradition is generally accepted within the field. The division then occurs when such contemporary painters, perhaps not understanding this vision or perhaps rebelling against it, produce such paintings anyway. These painters are then divided from other painters by virtue of their non-adherence to the nomos of the field. They are classified as a subordinate class of painter, one who is naive, ignorant, rebellious or misguided. One of the most dominant principles of vision and division in society is social class. Class relations maintain the status of objective social and cultural relations when in fact they are largely the arbitrary result of pre-existing economic relations. Doxa Another dynamic that structures a field is doxa. Doxa refers to the underlying and unquestioned opinions, beliefs and assumptions which are commonly held in a field. In Jensen's words, doxa is the state when the socially constructed is perceived as the natural order and therefore accepted. Doxa supports the classifications and power relations within a field. To give an example, in the field of Irish education in the 1960s, the belief that corporal punishment was moral and productive was doxic, it was presumed to be true. Equally, in the contemporary field of Irish education, the belief that corporal punishment is immoral and unproductive is doxic. Doxa are the beliefs which it is necessary to unreflectively hold in order to be active in the field. Illusio A third dynamic, not to be confused with nomos or doxa, is illusio. Illusio is the belief held by all agents in a field that the rewards of that field actually have any value. Effectively, the collective competition for specific capital in the field generates a belief in the value of that capital. The following is an example of illusio. Two lawyers have a child together. When their son is old enough to attend university, they advise him to study medicine, law or accountancy, believing in the value of these professional fields. But they are disappointed to learn that their child has no interest in such professions and wants to pursue a vocation in contemporary dance. Their disagreement with their child involves differences in their illusio. Their child believes in the value that the field of contemporary dance has to offer, be that self-expression, creative self-development, or simply the experience of dancing. The child's parents do not value these rewards so highly, if at all, valuing instead the income, job satisfaction and social status that professional fields can offer. For those beyond the doxic effect of a field, the value it offers can appear illusionary. Habitus Habitus is Bourdieu's most important concept. It allows field theory to account for people's agency within fields, that is, it accounts for how different people manage their resources differently. Bourdieu describes the habitus as a system of durable, transposable dispositions, functioning on the practical level as categories of perception and assessment or as classificatory principles, as well as being the organising principles of action. It is embodied in an immediate adherence to the tastes and distastes, sympathies and aversions, fantasies and phobias, which more than declared opinions, forges the unconscious unity of a class. The habitus of a person is most simply understood as the dispositions they have accumulated throughout their life. It is expressed in their attitudes and behaviour toward things. It is durable in that these attitudes and behaviours, though subject to change, are for the most part usually maintained throughout one's life. This is why the habitus is viewed as structuring. It informs one's current and future attitudes and strategies, 
by functioning as a collection of categories of perception, which themselves are based on previous categorizations, value systems, beliefs, assumptions and prejudices. It is also structuring because these dispositions, through agents' activities, affect the fields in which they operate. It is transposable in that a habitus adapted to one field is, to greater and lesser extents, suitable to and productive in other fields. It is also transposable because its constituent elements, for example, an interest in painting, can determine subsequent elements, such as an interest in photography. Dispositions give rise to other dispositions, and there is a somewhat systematic correlation between these dispositions and an agent's economic class. This is related to the structuring logic of association, according to which, if person A selects first this type of book, then they are likely to select that type of music, and then likely to select a particular type of film. Equally, there exists a logic of difference, whereby person A selects a book because it is not what person B would select. For Bourdieu, these strategies of distinction are instrumental in the symbolic domination of lower classes by higher classes. They primarily emerge in parallel with the societal distribution of inherited economic capital and serve to reproduce these economic distinctions through cultural practices. This logic of difference reveals the determination of agents' taste by cultural norms, even in cases of radical nonconformity. As Bourdieu points out, personal style is never more than a deviation in relation to a style of a period or class, so that it relates back to the common style, not only by its conformity, but also by its difference. For example, for punks in the 1970s, torn jeans functioned as a symbol of their deviation from societal norms. This deviation related back to the common style because the practice of wearing jeans, ripped or otherwise, conformed to a cultural norm, a pre-established style. The deviation related back to the common style in terms of difference, because the way in which it sought to be different had to make reference to the common style. This reference, though made in defiance, is a recognition of the common style and of its dominance. This recognition reproduces this dominance and therefore such deviations typically do little to affect it. This reproduction of symbolic domination occurs because such deviations typically do not attempt to overthrow the hierarchical category of styles. They simply seek a place within it, thus reinforcing the legitimacy of that hierarchy, a legitimacy on which their symbolic domination is based. Bourdieu distinguishes between the primary habitus and the secondary habitus. The primary habitus is the system of dispositions one embodies through socialization in the family environment during childhood. It is rather stable and reflects the different positions people have in society. The secondary habitus is built on the primary habitus and especially results from one's education in school and university, but also from other life experiences. More precisely, the secondary habitus is developed through an agent's experience of fields during adulthood. As the habitus organises principles of action, it affects how an agent behaves in different fields, though these fields also affect the development of that agent's habitus. Relatedly, there is always a foundational correlation, or in Bourdieu's terms, a homology, between an agent's habitus, their possession of capital, and their position in a field. In fact, the habitus is somewhat analogous to embodied cultural capital. As Grenfell states, the acquisition of embodied cultural capital is identical to the formation of the habitus. As there is a correlation between an agent's attitudes toward things and the fields in which they operate, particular habitus are suited to particular fields. When one feels at home in a field, when one feels that the attitudes and beliefs held by others in the field are congruent with their own, their habitus is in sync with the field. They are like a fish in water. 
However, when one feels out of place in a field, when one feels that the attitudes and beliefs held by others in the field are different than their own, their habitus is out of sync with the field. They are like a fish out of water. This dissonance between one's habitus and the field is often experienced by agents whose practices are not up to date with developments in the field. This time lag between an agent's habitus and the field is called hysteresis. It is often experienced by agents within the avant-garde and can be a catalyst for change within fields. To summarise, the habitus is necessarily based on agents' possession of capital and their experience in fields. It is structured by their previous experiences and structures their future actions. The Avant-Garde The Avant-Garde are agents in a field whose practices do not, in one way or another, adhere to the nomos of the field, and who therefore typically have little success within it. As we can see, this position is characterised by a low volume of economic and cultural capital, and a composition which favours cultural over economic. If, however, these agents manage to gain recognition for their practices within the field, that is, if they manage to overturn the nomos so that their transgressive practices are recognised as legitimate, they can become members of the consecrated avant-garde. The consecrated avant-garde are agents whose practices, though once seen as transgressing the nomos of the field, are now accepted. Importantly, the avant-garde can only be constituted when they become consecrated and therefore when they are no longer members of the real avant-garde. The real avant-garde then being the next generation of transgressive practices which will come to be recognised. As such, agents in avant-garde positions in the field are actually only a potential avant-garde in that they will most likely fail to achieve enough recognition to be constituted as an avant-garde. Agents in the consecrated avant-garde accumulate a high volume of symbolic capital from this position because their choice to adopt practices which were considered transgressive, practices which could not, at first, accumulate much recognition, is seen as evidence that their practices are based on pure motivations and not on the pursuit of economic profit or popularity. In effect, their practical disavowal of an interest in fame or money functions to increase the total volume of reputation and income they can accumulate from their practices. For Bourdieu, symbolic capital always functions as an untransubstantiated form of economic capital. That is, reputation can always be converted to money, and those who appear not to seek money, if the conditions are right and if they wait long enough, can convert the reputation they accumulated by being disinterested in money into money. For example, the legitimacy of street art was initially unrecognised by the field of contemporary art for a variety of reasons. At that time, there was an anonymous street artist who seemed not to care about recognition in the field or about making money. This artist appeared only to care about expressing his political opinions and about the development of his art form. But in time, largely because of this artist, street art came to be recognised in the field of contemporary art. At that point, in the field of contemporary art, this artist moved from a position in the avant-garde to the consecrated avant-garde. He then promptly began to accumulate symbolic capital in the field through a series of exhibitions in prestigious institutions. Furthermore, he began to convert that symbolic capital into money through the sale of screen-printed versions of his work in prestigious galleries. By reproducing street art in a commodity form and by actively seeking the rewards of the economically wealthy region of the field, that artist publicly recognised the value of economic capital, thereby legitimating the hierarchical relationships that economic capital institute in the field. Within fields, the consecrated avant-garde functions to legitimate the status quo and thereby ensure its reproduction. However, it is important not to reduce the motivations of the consecrated avant-garde 
to an interest in popularity and economic capital, as these are, in many cases, byproducts and not motivations. The rear guard is composed of artists from former generations of the consecrated avant garde who have been canonized within art history and whose symbolic capital is therefore beyond question. As such, the prices their works fetch in the art market are very stable. In the field of art, artists such as Rembrandt are members of the rear guard. I would like to conclude by pointing out that these explanations are simplified and partial and are only intended as an introduction to the main concepts used in field theory. Here are some useful references for those interested in learning more. 